Hello there everyone, UXW Bill coming to you live, okay, recorded live, edited later, pre-recorded, time shifted for you, all right, now I'm just overthinking it. Hello there everyone, UXW Bill here with you once again from a location we haven't seen on video in quite a long while, that is the Fortress of Amplitude, the name that I have coined for my live streaming studio. And yes, for those of you in the audience who happen to be wondering and don't happen to read video descriptions, although there are many of you out there who do, and all of you folks who read video descriptions are awesome and you smell good and you're great folks who, if you won the lottery, I'm sure you would give it all to charity. Seriously, well, unfortunately, there are some people who do not read video descriptions. So for those who do not, well, yes, I haven't done any publicly announced live streaming shows in a while, but I definitely do still pop on to the air from time to time. And your opportunity to watch, relative to the upload date of this video, will be tomorrow, because I am going all in on what is called an all-star show. There will be a number of people broadcasting, myself included. I will try to get a schedule and post that in the video description so that you'll know who's on first, what's on second, I don't know is on third, and so on and so forth. And that way you can be sure to avoid my terrible show while watching some people who actually have of talent in broadcasting. But one of the things that I have to do to get my studio ready is to service the uninterruptible power supply. I'll go ahead and move this derelict computer case here and then walk the handy cam over to where you might actually be able to see it. This uninterruptible power supply is an APC Smart UPS 1500 and it backs up my whole studio. Now granted it doesn't do so for terribly long because when the studio is up and running well, I would take a guess that I'm probably pulling somewhere in the neighborhood of around 650 to 750 watts worth of power, especially because I have some wow. standard definition CRT style television sets that I use for the purpose of monitoring various pieces of video equipment. You can barely see the other one back there. And granted, I could use, for those of you who will undoubtedly ask about such a thing, I could use a standard definition or even a high definition LCD television set, probably draw a lot less power. But the one thing I've noticed about most LCD television sets and similar flat panel TVs is that the picture quality absolutely stinks when they're receiving standard definition. And we're not even going to get into the subject of my broadcasting in high definition. It's not going to happen because I am in no position to buy that kind of equipment. You can blow a lot of budget in a big hurry doing that kind of a thing, and my internet connection bandwidth would never handle it. So the decision is closed, plus the fact that I can pick up used video cameras and even a lot of video handling equipment for next to nothing on the second-hand market as long as it's analog standard definition gear, well, that pretty much goes to make the decision as well. But getting back to the real subject of this video, the Smart UPS, I'm going to do two things. The first thing I'm going to do is change the batteries in this unit. It's been a number of years since I've had a good, truly new battery pack in this unit. The ones that it has in it right now are ones that I robbed from a larger Smart UPS 2200 that I'm actually not using at the moment because it needs some attention. And those batteries are from 2011. Now they do still work. They will still hold this load, but they only hold it for a very, very short period of time. And I know that this UPS should be capable of carrying that load for a lot longer a period of time than it does. Plus, those batteries are four years old. They did sit disused for a while, which certainly doesn't help them. And so I just decided to go ahead, even though I couldn't really justify the expenditure, to go ahead and get new batteries for this. So the first thing we'll do is we'll pop the front cover off of this unit and we'll set it on top. Now you can change the batteries in these things hot. APC says that that is specifically allowed. But one thing they do caution you about, and something that you should be very keenly aware of if you decide to do this kind of thing yourself, remove anything that might conduct electricity from your body because if you inadvertently short across the batteries or their terminals or you fall foul of the uninterruptible power supply's internal circuitry, well something like a watch can lead to a hand being amputated, a ring on your finger. They can get so hot that they'll cauterize or kill all the blood vessels running to that particular appendage and then you'll have no choice about the matter. You'll just be losing it no matter what. And if you think that doesn't sound like a party, you're absolutely right. Now getting the batteries out of these things is pretty easy. Probably going to go ahead and unplug this unit before I actually pull them. 
because there will be something else that I'm going to do a little later in this video when it comes to putting the new batteries in. You can run these uninterruptible power supplies via their network management card or through the APC PowerShoot Pro software. Something like uh, Network UPS tools might be able to do it as well. You can run these things through what's called a runtime calibration, which allows the microcontroller to sense that fresh batteries have been installed and to calibrate its runtime accordingly. However, I have found a much better way in recent years, and that is to simply use a piece of software developed by someone in Russia to reprogram the unit's so-called battery constant. The battery constant is a value stored in the ROM of these units, and what it represents is how long the unit should operate on a given set of batteries in a given condition with a given load. Over time, that number drops down, and I have found that even if you do run the calibration process, which is what APC would normally have you do, it doesn't always serve to get things back to a sane state. I've had a couple of these whose learning curve was so near to horizontal you could almost bowl on it. So, go ahead, and well, that reminds me of some people who post nasty comments on my YouTube videos, come to think of it. <laughs> so let's go ahead and unplug that, just to be good and safe about it. There's certainly still enough electricity available here on very short notice to ruin your day, but it does reduce the risk surface a little bit. And there was a time when I was taking the batteries out of this thing in the past and it momentarily blipped itself to life, which I guess, I, I don't know what caused it. I really couldn't tell you unless maybe it was this little metal, little metal ferrule or whatever that thing is. Maybe you call that a woggle, I don't know. <laughs> In case you're not familiar with the term woggle, that's actually the little plastic piece that is used to slide up and down a headset, the wire leading up to a headset, so that you can spread it apart or bring it back together, depending upon how large your head is and how far apart your ears are as a result. So I don't know what this is, but I'm guessing that maybe it could have touched a, a low voltage logic circuit in this thing and caused it to think it should turn on for a moment. I don't know. Just safer not to t chance fate, I think. Then you unplug the power pole connector. Now if you really wanted to be safe, once this unit's been unplugged, you could hold down the zero button, but the UPS really won't care too much either way, and after a couple of minutes it will do that so that the microcontroller doesn't run down its batteries. And speaking of the batteries, here they are in all their really kind of dusty glory. <laughs> I mean, the thing's got a fan in it, but it doesn't really run that often. And there's also some evidence here that maybe those batteries aren't in the best of repair any longer. That maybe this one on the left hand or the rearward facing side has had some of its electrolyte boiled out of it. One thing that these units can do is charge their batteries too aggressive over the years. And some people fault various things for that. I don't know how much the battery constant value plays into it, but uh, there are charging adjustments that can be made in software through this thing's serial console. Some people choose to adjust the charging voltage downwards so it's not as hard on the batteries. And some people also go for inspection, looking around for blown capacitors and things like that. I actually did recap this unit a number of years ago. That's how I came to have it. It is showing some minor signs by making a periodic pulsating noise that maybe it needs a new capacitor. Yet again, very hard to tell. But now that I've got the batteries out, let's go ahead and talk about what you do and where you go to get replacements. You can see that this unit has a excuse me, a genuine APC battery cartridge in it right now. And if you're absolutely made of money, as this unit's previous owners and the Smart UPS 2200's previous owners obviously were, you can get yourself a genuine APC battery pack, but you will pay a lot more for it than you should. Now, if you're considering getting replacement UPS batteries from someone other than the manufacturer of your uninterruptible power supply, there are several important questions that come to mind. One of the most important, however, is how do I know what I should buy? Well, fortunately, that's very easy because in almost every case, the popular US UPS manufacturers all use standard lead-acid batteries that regular people like you and I can buy. 
and at least in most cases, they don't go out of their way to disguise the true maker. American Power Conversion has actually faced these two lead-acid batteries close to one another so that the maker of the battery is not readily visible. But if we disassemble this pack, which is actually very easy to do, save for fighting off some adhesive tape, the manufacturer of the batteries, their voltage output, and their capacity expressed in amp hours in most cases will become visible. It will look very similar to this battery that I removed from a non-functional vehicle booster starter pack. And you can see right away that not only is the model number on the battery, but so too is the voltage and its capacity in terms of amp hours. So what you do is you go out and you buy a battery that matches those characteristics, and the form factors are pretty standard. So should be pretty hard to go wrong with this. And as far as what kind of battery you should buy, or at least what brand of battery, well, I find that sealed lead acid batteries are pretty much sealed lead acid batteries across the board. I expect this is the one point where some people are going to jump in in the comments and say that I'm wrong. All I can tell you about that is it's been my personal experience that any one brand of sealed lead acid battery is as good as another, regardless of whether it's cheap or expensive. The only departure I have had from that rule of thumb is with PowerSonic batteries. Now, they're a big name in this kind of thing, but for some reason, when their batteries fail, and I have certainly seen plenty of them, as I have plenty of other makes, including many no-name batteries, fail as well, it seems that the PowerSonic batteries always manage to fail grotesquely. They last well, don't get me wrong, in most cases. But when they fail, they can oftentimes bloat and crack, and that greatly complicates replacing the batteries that you have, especially if you have to deal with cleaning up and neutralizing the acid. So these were some batteries that I found for sale on eBay. They were the cheapest thing going, just bought them on price. We need two of them. There's one right here, and there's one on top of the stereo. Now, being as these are lead acid batteries, a person should be very careful not to let their weight take them by surprise or catch them off guard. Buying batteries should be done from someone who moves batteries in quite a bit of volume because freshness is very important with lead-acid batteries such as these. But once you have your batteries, you're ready to disassemble the old pack and reassemble the new one. And it's really not too terribly hard to do this. Basically, the only thing you need to do, take these two end caps off, and depending upon how much time the batteries have had in the weather, those may come off pretty easily. These have been thumping around in my truck bed for probably about a month now. And then you need to disconnect the terminals from the battery. You need to save these. And there's a fuse over here that you also need to save. This looks like not unlike an automotive maxi fuse or something similar to that. I know that the UPSs these batteries are used in typically have protection in the form of fuses inside their inverter. I'd really hate to see the aftermath of a fuse like this blowing because somehow I don't think that it would survive the experience. That's probably one of the reasons why they have a protective end cap at both ends, to keep the terminals from shorting out over here and to keep the fuse from making an absolute mess of things should it decide to blow itself up violently, as it probably would in the face of a short circuit. Now again, same caution applies as when you're removing the batteries from the uninterruptible power supply. You need to be very, very sure that you've removed any conductive jewelry or similar from your hands. And if you have a health issue, such as a pacemaker or something similar, it may be best that you don't even consider trying this. Now to go ahead and remove these, being careful not to short across them, especially at this end, because even with fairly dead batteries, you'll probably still get a pretty good zap out of them. You'll need a screwdriver and a wrench or a nut driver to get at the tap on the other end. Now sometimes, sometimes you can manage successfully to just unscrew these and they'll go ahead and come out nicely. Sometimes the friction of the tap against the side of the fuse or side of the battery or something allows the screw to come out nicely, but that is definitely the exception rather than the rule. You need to make a note of how all this stuff was wired up as well because you have to put it back exactly the same way or you will probably smell smoke coming out of your UPS sooner rather than later, and you certainly don't want that. So now I've got the fuse out and I've saved all the hardware that goes with it. I'll go ahead and go over and get these terminals over here and we'll put everything together in a new pack. Now APC originally used double-sided sticky tape for this. 
I'm just going to go ahead and use a couple layers of packing tape because it's what I happen to have handy. You probably want to go as close to the original approach as you can, especially if you intend to do something like shipping the UPS, but I know that unit is going to stay pretty much where it's put, especially once I get these batteries inside it, because it's not much fun to move it with the batteries. APC sometimes cautions you against that, especially if you have a unit with a battery box. But they, uh, what, what they don't take into account is I think you're much more likely to bust your rivet than you are to suffer accidentally shorting the batteries in the battery box if you don't take them out of that container first. But enough of that. Time for me to go ahead and disconnect these terminals, and then we'll hook everything up over here and make a package deal out of the unit. I have returned, and while the camcorder has been shut off, I've made significant progress in assembling these new batteries for use in the uninterruptible power supply. I recommend that if you're going to do this yourself, that you install the leads in the connector first, because so long as nothing is connected back here, you cannot accidentally create a short circuit or a bridge between these two terminals with potentially explosive consequences. You can also see that I have gone ahead and joined these two batteries together with some packing tape. And that brings to mind another potential caution. These, like any other lead-acid battery ever made, need to vent from time to time, despite their designation as being a sealed battery. They actually contain a valve that allows them to emit hydrogen gas in the case of an overcharging situation. And if you mummify your battery in tape or put it inside a gas-tight enclosure or do something along those lines, and the battery should start to overcharge or just in its normal course of operation, you could be making a bomb and you really don't want to do that. So even though the location of the vents are not obvious on these batteries, do not place them in a gas-tight situation. And finally, rounding out the safety precautions, at least for this installment, do make an inspection of the electrical hardware. There is a lot of current that ends up flowing through these things, and it is of the utmost importance to make sure that nothing is burned, corroded, chafed, worn out, Anything along those lines that signifies trouble, electrical wiring and fuses are cheap. Things like your home or your business are not, so don't take chances. If something looks questionable, dump it and get a replacement, because there's so much current flowing here that you could easily have a fire in very short order. People can weld from batteries this size. It's possible to do arc welding with a couple of these bad boys in series or parallel, sometimes even by themselves in the case of larger batteries than these. You don't need to think about that for too long before you realize that there is a very definite possibility of fire hazard, a significant fire hazard. And these batteries can also explode if they are shorted for a prolonged period of time. So don't take that chance. Make sure that everything is in tip-top shape before you go ahead and actually decide that you're going to reuse it. And there's the replacement battery fully assembled. Now one thing that's very important to keep in mind as you make the final assembly are these two top covers. If you have lost these or do not have them, you should certainly fashion replacements out of something. Probably not something flammable like cardboard, but even a simple bit of tape, a plastic piece, something along those lines. Basically as long as it doesn't conduct electricity and won't burn too easily in the event something bad happens, you need to make covers for these so that no part of the battery can touch the frame or the electronics in the UPS and cause a nasty short circuit with potentially fiery consequences. If you really want to be sure of things, go ahead and take a multimeter at this point and verify not only the output voltage of your batteries, but also the polarity as well. Because I don't know how well APC protects even their higher end UPS units from reversed polarity. They may assume that it can never happen because you'll always be buying APC batteries that have been pre-wired from the factory in exactly the correct way. Now obviously that's not the case here. So making polarity and voltage measurements is cheap insurance. Here's the newly reassembled battery pack all ready and waiting to be installed. So the moment of truth has arrived. Now don't be too surprised if your uninterruptible power supply emits a noticeable crackle or even a small pop from the terminals as you reconnect them to power. It's perfectly normal as the capacitors inside the unit charge up and things like that. Some UPSs might even try to turn themselves on, but I've never had a smart UPS do that to my recollection. Other models might differ. So we'll go ahead and haul this out here where we can actually get at it. And we'll make sure that the plus and the minus are lined up. We'll plug it in. Nothing to it. 
And we just push the batteries in there, move this plug in a little bit, put the metal plate on the front if it hasn't disappeared by now. Nope, it's right here. Making sure not to pinch or otherwise abuse too much of the wiring because that again could result in potentially fiery consequences. And then all you have to do is just go ahead and screw this front panel on. Now for some makes and models of uninterruptible power supply you might be done or very close to. But American Power Conversion, as previously mentioned, makes things a little bit more complex than that. And to really do this right, we'll need a computer and some supplemental software, which I will talk about more in just a moment. And in the meantime, if I don't uh, completely obliterate the Handycam by inadvertently striking it, <laughs> I'll go ahead and plug the power back into the unit. It may emit a couple of relay clicks here. Might also beep and light the front panel briefly. I don't know if it lit the front panel or not. I couldn't actually see it. But the thing we need to do now is to make sure that this thing not only knows, but can also appreciate what we have just done to it. And you could do this by running a runtime calibration procedure or something along those lines. But in this case, we're going to do something smarter. And to do that, I'll need to dig up the trash top. Why do I call it the trash top? Well, you'll get to know more in just a minute, as soon as I've found it and everything that I need in order to do this. Ladies and gentlemen, behold the trash top laptop. What would ever possess me to give an otherwise perfectly functional computer such an appalling name? Well, the simple fact of the matter that it's the truth might have a lot to do with it. Back before my dad retired from his regular line of work, he would occasionally have the opportunity to see things that people had set out for the trash. And this laptop, a Dell Latitude of some description, was one of those things. I did actually make a video about this machine, as well as replacement of the keyboard in my Latitude D800 that I bought brand new, but ultimately I decided that A, I didn't like that video, and B, I couldn't publish it for other reasons, so it's never surfaced. Don't worry, you haven't missed anything. <laughs> it was a pretty long and rambly video. At first, this machine doesn't look like it's in too bad of a shape, but then you look at the bottom of it and you say, wow, what happened to that poor thing? <laughs> I don't know. It definitely hasn't had an easy life. And it's still running the software that came with it, which is not a genuine copy of Microsoft Windows XP. So don't be surprised when that notification comes up. Before I start it up, however, you know how I'm always going on and on and on about how real computers have legacy ports such as Parallel Serial and PS2, and they also tend to have floppy drives, which this machine doesn't, but it could certainly have one added via the uh, multi-purpose bay. Well, for this exercise, you're going to need a computer with uh, real classic ports on it, such as this Dell Latitude laptop. Perhaps you could use a USB to serial adapter for this. I don't know. I've never tried it. And if you do, well, it's your own funeral. As with every other part of this video, everything that you see here is presented in good faith, but with as much liability disclaimed as is legally possible, maybe even a little bit more. You will also need the APC serial cable that came with your uninterruptible power supply. You can see the number on this one. In the event that you can't read it, it is a 940-0024C. This is sometimes called a smart communication cable. You need to attach it to the serial port on your computer. If your APC UPS has a smart slot card in it, you need to remove it temporarily. And to do that, you should have the UPS completely powered off. A good time to do that is when you are actually servicing the batteries. So we'll go ahead and turn the UPS on. And we didn't get any six-foot flames or anything, which is always a good sign. Not even out of the laptop. It's probably going to run a self-test for us here soon. You can hear the fan kick in and all that good stuff. Maybe it's another UPS that I'm confusing that one with that's got the periodic hum that I recently learned indicates a particular bad capacitor. And of course this thing has no memory of its uh, CMOS settings whatsoever, but we don't need those in order for it to boot, so I'll just go ahead and tell it to start up. 
I will link the website from the video description where you need to go in order to get this software. You will have to use a popular translation service like say Google Translate or Bing Translate, maybe even Alta Vista, Babelfish, if that still happens to be a thing. That should show you about how old school I am. <laughs> but if you don't want to use the software, well, you can contact American Power Conversion, and I hear that if you are polite and persuasive enough, they'll tell you what the battery constant for your particular uninterruptible power supply model actually is. So go ahead and get logged on here. There you can see Windows has popped up that lovely message about software counterfeiting and that I should do something about it right away. I'll tell you what I'm going to do about it. I'll run the Universal Removals un Windows Uninstallation Tool, <laughs> known as D-Ban. Oh, but for the meantime, it works well enough for our needs. This thing has been sitting on the shelf, utterly forgotten. And let's go ahead and see what we've got here. This software comes up, and it's a little less than obvious how to use it. At least that's what I found. So if you're having a problem with this, well, I'll try to explain it at least in fairly basic easy to understand terms with uh, relatively simple language used throughout. Before you go ahead and start doing anything with this particular software, you need to set the options. And if you've run this software in the past, you may find that the options are already set, in which case you don't have to do anything. But what we actually want to do, we want to tell this thing to do the battery constant automatic fix. And as far as I know, this is every bit as good as calling American Power Conversion. And then the next thing we'll do, if you'll pardon the squeaking tripod, we'll go down here, specify the serial port, and when you do this, this thing will start communicating with the uninterruptible power supply immediately, and your UPS may make a sound not unlike someone spinning that big wheel on the price is right. Don't worry, it's doing what it needs to do in order to fix the battery constant value. In fact, I'll try and get the camera in approximately the right place, and as soon as I've chosen the serial port and this thing has opened communications, you will probably see the battery constant current value and the value it's about to be changed to. Now, it may not change very much, because I was playing around with this when the UPS still had its previous set of batteries in it, and so the microcontroller may not have dropped the value down such that it needs to be repaired, but we shall see. We now have a connection to the UPS. Don't be surprised if this takes a little bit. It's not the fastest means of communication. And as I'm sure you just saw, it changed the battery const calibration constant right here. So with that done, you can actually close this software and you can put your UPS back into regular service if you would like. It appears that while this software can in fact display the date of the last battery replacement, which was correct, well, you can't actually change any of those values, at least not that I found. Maybe you can. It's hard for me to tell because the original website's in Russian and the translation's not always that great, so I didn't necessarily read it as carefully as I should have. <laughs> I probably should have read it a little bit more carefully than I did because all these other values, they seem to be read-only, like the name of the UPS here, the battery replacement date. Fear not, however, because there is actually a way to change the battery replacement date if you have either PowerShoot Professional Edition or you have a network management card installed in the UPS, as I do. So go ahead and close this software, zoom out with the camcorder, and shut down the good old trash top, and forget about it for another couple of months at least. And while we're on the exceedingly exciting subject of both batteries and trash, it's worth mentioning that the Trash Tops battery is completely trashed. If your APC uninterruptible power supply is equipped with a network management card, here are some other things that you can do. Likewise, you can also do some of these things from within the APC PowerShoot Professional software. But as far as I know, unless you have a copy of that software already, it's not very easy to get. Well, maybe you could find it on eBay or something. I don't know. 
APC does not make it available for download to the best of my knowledge and it also appears to be abandonware at this particular point because they've never updated it since the early 2000s. So if you're doing this on a particularly late model APC uninterruptible smart UPS power supply you may not actually be able to do some of these things. If you decide that you do want to have a network management card for your UPS, the old models such as the AP 96, 17, 18, and 19, which all have slightly different capabilities, they show up on eBay for very little money all the time. You should be able to find one for well under $30 or thereabouts. And when you do have one, you can go to the UPS tab, Look under the configuration category, choose the general subcategory, and you can specify things like your UPS's name, and you can also choose the replacement battery date if you have done so. And then you just apply those settings. And while we are on the exceedingly exciting subject of uninterruptible power supply runtime and loading, not to mention trying to make at least a token effort to get this particular video wrapped up, there's an electrical change that I'm going to make to the Fortress of Amplitude live streaming studio. As you can see, I have purchased a second American Power Conversion Smart UPS. This one is a little bit smaller than the one I just put new batteries in. Got this on eBay from a seller that installed brand new batteries in it. Basically did some uh, very minor reconditioning on it. As you can see, it's a little bit rough, but it does appear to work and work very well. The reasoning behind this being that at least as per my personal experience, once again, a more lightly loaded UPS is a happier UPS. Now someone gave me an essentially brand new APC Smart UPS 750, one of the very newest models with the uh, LCD screen on the front of it that gives you all kinds of advanced status. But there were two reasons why I didn't use it. First of all, I thought that for perhaps 750 volt amps worth of capacity was probably still a little bit small for what I had in mind. Secondly, although the menu is nice and tells you all kinds of things and those units have upgradable firmware, well, nothing beats the very simple on and off control set that these older units have. If ever you needed to turn anything off in a heck of a hurry, you just can't do it with the newer ones, at least not to my knowledge. You've got to go through a menu, confirm that you wish to power the unit off. Maybe you can hold down the power button for five seconds. But when you've got a problem and you need to shut power off now, that really just doesn't cut it. Now, this unit's a little bit interesting, as despite the fact that it's only 500 volt amps smaller than the one you just saw, it hasn't actually got a cooling fan inside it. I really cannot imagine that it'll be too happy about being asked to deliver its full load. And as I said, it's been my personal experience that a more lightly loaded UPS is much happier than one that's loaded to within an, in an inch of its life. Once had an, or once was responsible for an APC Smart UPS 2200 that was carrying an 80% load, and while it held that load and did an admirable job, even though it has fan-forced cooling and the fan was working, it started to smell like burning after a while. And that's something I'd rather not push as hard on. So I figure it's better to keep these units at or around 50% of their capacity at best. That way you're not beating the absolute life out of the batteries. And you're also not abusing the inverter too horribly and potentially causing it to overheat. I was surprised to see inside this unit, although it is 500 volt amps smaller, and the cover on this one is much, much tighter <laughs> than my old 1500. Of course, this one's from about 2008. And as such, they were no longer making them in the United States of America at that point. I don't have a screwdriver handy to demonstrate this, so I'll have to get one. But I'll be right back. I was actually quite surprised to see that this unit uses considerably smaller batteries and there's actually quite a lot of dead space up in the cabinet. I don't know if you could actually get two ranks of these batteries in there. For this particular model, APC did sell a model, a variant called the Smart UPS 1000 XL, which has provisions for battery boxes to be attached to the back of it. But I don't know if you could put more inside there, and I don't know if you could remove this guide and install larger batteries. You probably could if you were feeling adventurous. I would imagine the framework is the same basic form of metal for all of these units. 
As you can see, although this unit is just 500 volt amps smaller than the sibling, than its sibling down in the basement, it's also got quite a bit smaller wiring, lighter wiring, and not as heavy of a connection at all the contact points compared to the larger unit. But there's still an inline fuse, and once again somebody just assembled a battery pack out of aftermarket parts for this particular unit, which in my opinion, as previously stated, is definitely the way to go. The only real reason to use the APC RBCs or if you have a unit under warranty, or an extended service contract, or you think that someone is going to pitch a fit if they discover that you have used a non-genuine APC battery, something along those lines. But I think most people can be safely, blissfully ignorant of such things and not worry about being tied down to any one particular brand of batteries, especially if you have a unit whose manufacturer no longer exists or has long since forgotten about the product that you have, despite the fact that it still works fine. Well, this video has run to about 37 and a half minutes at this point, probably a little less after editing, settling, shipping, and gouging, those sorts of things. So if you have stuck it out with me this long, I certainly do appreciate it. <laughs> I thank you as always for watching, all of you who invest the time in watching my videos, it's very much appreciated because I enjoy making them for a receptive community. And if you have a comment of a productive nature, well, by all means, certainly do feel free to leave it. Since most all of you have been such an awesome viewing audience at this point, here's a little teaser of something to come way in the future. This one's a long way down the pipe because it's going to take several hundred dollars worth of batteries, even if I do it the cheap way, to put this whole mess together.